Welcome to Birkbeck, and welcome to Stoicism for Everyday Life. Um, thank you all for coming. We literally had no idea how many people were actually going to turn up. You don't know. We issued tickets in order to try to have some idea of how many people might be interested. And at 11 o'clock last night, some people were cancelling tickets. And at 10 minutes past midnight this morning, other people were accepting offers of tickets. So it's been fluid right up to the last moment. But thank you all very much for coming. My name's John Sellers. I teach philosophy here at Birkbeck. And I'm one member of the Stoicism Today team. A project like this is quite difficult. It throws up all sorts of philosophical problems. It throws up all sorts of methodological problems. It's by no means straightforward on a theoretical level, even if it's quite easy to um, put advice online and say, do this. We're going to take over the whole building this afternoon. We're going to use this room and six rooms upstairs. Um, just out of curiosity, how many people here in the room have been following Stoic Week this week? OK, a, a, good, a good number. Excellent, good. Um, I should also say thanks to Bert Beck for hosting us today and for giving us support in all sorts of other, other ways. Thanks also to the University of Exeter, who are hosting us at the other end. Exeter is the nerve centre of the Stoic Week project. Thanks also to Queen Mary, University of London, with whom one of our team is associated, who've also supported us. And most of all, to the Arts and Humanities Research Council. Let me now pass you on to the first of our little introductory talks. So, Professor Christopher Gill, Professor of Ancient Thought at the University of Exeter. I don't think he'd like it if I described him as our glorious leader, but <laughs> <laughs> he's definitely the, 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 the primary motivating force behind the project. Without Chris, the project wouldn't be happening. So, Chris, over to you. Yeah, yeah. Well, th yes. <laughs> um, thanks very much. Um, I, I'd like to talk a, a bit about the background of the project, um, introduce the group who's been working together, and then um, briefly try and summarize some of the key ideas that I think are going to run through the day. Um, the background of the project was a workshop held at Exeter uh, in uh, autumn 2012. And the idea then was to think about, I'd been working on stoic practical ethics, and the idea was then to think about ways in which stoic practical ethics, which was so useful in the past, could be useful today. So we brought together a number of academics and psychotherapists, including those here, to talk about that. Now, there are quite a lot of these kind of workshops these days in universities, public engagement workshops, and I think what often happens is People come together, have 24 hours of stimulating discussion, they go away, and nothing happens. Um, well, that wasn't the case with ours, I have to say. Um, par partly because perhaps the topic and partly because of the group we had together, we, we immediately started collaborating on a quite informal basis with no funding, actually. Um, and we... Um, organized together the, the first Live Like a Stoic Week last, last year in 2012, uh, followed by um, 150 people, and set up a blog. And then we've gone on um, keeping in contact with each other and planning and thinking about what to do next. Then I got funding for uh, this, this uh, renewal of the, the project. And, this, and so we were able to, to do it again and do it in a, in a, in a fuller, more uh, comprehensive way and to involve many more people and um, arouse a lot of interest, which is wonderful, wonderful for us. So that's the background of the project. Now, the people involved, perhaps if I could just, just introduce uh, or present uh, those, all of whom are on, on the stage. Uh, Jules Evans, uh, author of Philosophy of Life. Jules, indicate which way, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and uh, who, is, who is also working at Queen Mary University of London in the uh, History of Emotions project, and who will be leading a workshop. Um, Tim LeBon, uh, counsellor and psychotherapist, especially interested in the, the role of philosophy in informing psychotherapy, Richard. Um, and who's very interested in 
the question of how we uh, build up an evidence base for stoicism. Donald Robertson, uh, also CBT uh, psychotherapist and someone who's worked perhaps more than anyone on the cusp of stoicism and psychotherapy. He has a well-known book on uh, stoicism and psychotherapy and his new book on Teach Yourself Stoicism will be appearing early uh, in 2014 and he's joined us from Canada where he's living at the moment. Uh, Patrick Usher, a PhD student who's working on ideas of development, personal development in Stoicism uh, and Patrick uh, has played a key role, a very key role in the development of the project uh, he has been managing the blog, the amazing blog, which, which has attracted so many hits. And he, it was his idea to have a Live Like a Stoic Week uh, uh, last year. And he's, he's been really um, a moving spirit in, in the, whole, the whole thing. Um, and Jill, Gar Jill Garrett, who's also a CBT therapist, uh, has brings to the project a very rich and varied career that I heard a lot of details about, and some of you, you did too, uh, the other day at King's, um, and whose specialism is CBT for work, and that's what she's giving her workshop on and has just published a book on. So that's the, that's the team, um, and everyone will be taking part and be getting involved later on today in different ways. Just a brief... Uh, set of ideas. Many of you will, you know, you'll, you'll have, many of you will already have lots of ideas about Stoicism, but just here's, I think, four absolutely key ideas in Stoicism. One is the idea that we all, all of us, all of us human beings have the capacity to produce our own happiness, to make happiness, make our own lives happy. And that's not the belief of some kind of deluded optimism. That's because Stoics believed and believe, if you accept the philosophy today, that happiness derives not from money, celebrity, uh, social position, but from developing the, the qualities that are essential to a human life, developing what they call the virtues, wisdom, justice, self-control, um, and, and, and building those up, developing those qualities, and making them fundamental to your um, motives, your emotions, uh, your relationships, and to the way you view and understand the world. So that's what they think happiness is, roughly, and that's why, and they think that all human beings, as such, have the capacity to do that, whatever their social situation and context and background. Um, and the corollary of that is, the corollary of that conviction is that things that, are, that, that you, we cannot control, the many things we cannot control, getting money or indeed health or even securing the well-being of those we love, that those things, though important, though it's natural for us to find them important, they are less important fundamentally than developing the virtues, developing the, the qualities that are essential to a human life. So I think if there's a single core idea that's most important, and perhaps most important for, for some of the things we're doing, that, that is, it, there is that. Another aspect that's also important, and not always, not always recognized, is that the Stoics believed that all human beings, and indeed all animals, have a natural desire to benefit uh, others of their kind. Uh, that's true of a animals in general, not just human beings. But human beings have the capacity to do this in a rational way and to use that rationality in a way that informs the, the, their desire, their instinct to benefit others. And there's two particular ways in which Stoics are interested in that development. One is through engagement in family life, in in neighborhood, in communities, in politics, that that's part of a natural human life to do that. But another more distinctive and very important aspect of their thinking about community is that we can and should work towards the idea that all human beings as such are part of a single connected brotherhood. They are our brothers or sisters. 
they are members of, of fellow citizens of the universe. And both those two ideas, they might seem in contradiction, but, but I think they're not, and they, they go together. The third aspect of Stoicism, perhaps, perhaps the most famous, is their beliefs about human psychology. They're often thought as to be unrealistic intellectualists, but I think that's quite wrong. I think their core claim is that human psychology functions as one. We have a unified whole psychology of, of such a kind that beliefs, beliefs inform emotions and desires. And I think they believe what, one of the most important things they want to say is that the, the more profoundly we change our beliefs, the more profoundly we come to a better understanding of ourselves and the world, the, the more our, our emotions will be changed by that. That's the root, I think, of the stereotype of the stoic upper lip, the idea that, uh, that changes of belief will bring, bring about changes of emotion and desire. And finally, um, there are their view, they have important views about the world or the universe. These are perhaps for modern uh, people who want to take on board Stoicism some of the most difficult aspects, I think. But roughly what they want to claim is that the world or universe is unified, that it is providentially shaped in some sense, and that it is permeated by God as they understand God, not a personal God, but a kind of principle of order and rationality. Um, but one aspect of that, which links in very much with the other th points which I've made, is that they believed that the universe is the kind of world in which it is, in which it is part, the, the desire to do these things which I've been describing. The, 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 um, the desire to develop in, 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 in the way I've described, that that is part of our nature. That it is, is, it is natural for us and it is open to us, and it is, as it were, inbuilt in human nature that we have these capacities to develop I in the way that Stoics uh, commend. Okay, well, that's enough, I think, of, uh, of, of some ideas. Now, uh, if I could now hand over to Patrick, who's going to talk about our Live Like a Stoic Week. So Stoicism's been in the air a bit recently. Just last Saturday evening, Doctor Who started with a quote from Marcus Aurelius. Um, and he, it was, do not dream of becoming a good man, just be one. So it seems like the kind of Stoic logos is at work in some curious way. Um, but what I'm going to do just now is I'm going to talk about um, what's been happening around the world in Stoic Week. Uh, as you know, if you're following the handbook, today is the Philanthropy Day, uh, which focuses on the ideal of the community of humankind. And this truly has been a worldwide event, uh, all the way to Thailand, to India, to Brunei, uh, of course, US and Canada and places closer to home. But um, Stoic Week really has been taking part all around the world. And I'm going to give you some idea of the kind of events that have been happening. I'm also going to talk about some of the media that it's uh, interest it's generated. And in doing so, I'm going to pick out a few quotations from different media, which will feed into the roundtable discussion that we're going to have um, in about half an hour. Um, so kind of issues feeding into that. So overall, about 2,200 people uh, completed all the scales for the week, which is about 20 times more than last year. Uh, so, that's, so that's pretty good. Um, okay. Um, so you can't actually see because we're kind of in the way, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it's okay. It's okay, don't worry, I'll just read it out. Um, so Stoic Week has appeared uh, in the Financial Times, Times Literary Supplement, The Spectator, The Daily Telegraph, Channel 4, Toronto Globe and Mail, where it was front page news, uh, Elle Magazine in Canada, The Gilo in Slovenia, The Irish Times, The Las Vegas Guardian Express, and Top News US in America. And I think Top News United Arab Emirates as well uh, had it. So it's really... The Plymouth, the Plymouth Herald. <laughs> yeah, that's right, The Plymouth Herald had it. Um, so what I'd like to do is just to, there was a really interesting column in the Financial Times by the Shrink and the Sage, who are, of course, taking part uh, in, in the roundtable discussion later. Um, and I just thought they had made some interesting points, some issues to feed in uh, to that discussion. Uh, the Shrink said uh, about Stoicism that I advise 
unashamedly cherry-picking. We live in very different times, and it would be unreasonable to take on chapter and verse of Stoic philosophy. The broad message is to think rationally, examine our emotions, and challenge our assumptions about what has value. For anything more specific, we should engage creatively with the literature and decide for ourselves what is likely to enhance or diminish our life experience. That's really a question of, when you're approaching Stoicism, how much is enough for it to make a difference in someone's life? Uh, should you go the whole way, or are there, should you just focus on some elements? The sage um, said, of course we can adapt and borrow any particular Stoic methods that work, but that no more makes you a Stoic than practicing meditation makes you a Buddhist. Like any philosophical position, Stoicism itself stands or falls, or more likely limps along, on the soundness of its arguments, not its effect on our psychological well-being. Philosophy is first and foremost the pursuit of truth, albeit without a capital T. Uh, so the idea, I mean, if you do take out some core elements of Stoicism, is it really Stoicism, is one of the questions. Another important uh, issue, and one that the workshops will focus on later today, uh, is how Stoic practical ethics can help in schools. Um, and Jules Evans in the Toronto Globe and Mail said, uh, it's a helpful idea for young people to have a sense of self that's slightly detached from the approval of other people. They're growing up in a world of social networks where their reputation is out of their control. Every month, some young person commits suicide because of online bullying. With Stoicism, they can learn not to tie their sense of self-worth to their reputation, because reputation exists in the opinion of others, and other people's judgment is sometimes wrong. So, you know, could Stoicism really help someone in a very difficult situation growing up with online bullying? Uh, could it really be something that helps? Stoic Week also appeared uh, on different radio stations. Uh, it was on the BBC Radio 4 Today program uh, with Professor Chris Gill, and Edith Hall, uh, sorry, Angie Hobbs. Um, Angie Hobbs raised the question, as you can see on the tweet up there on the top left. Uh, she said, I think that anger is the right and necessary response to certain people, actions, or events. So she's criticizing the Stoic theory of emotions. I think Chris will have a few things to say about that later. Um, in the meantime, uh, Jules appeared on BBC Nightwaves with Professor Edith Hall. Uh, and Edith, again, questioned whether uh, Stoic Week and the Handbook, whether that was even really Stoicism. So that's another question for the, for the round table. Um, also, there was something on uh, BBC World Service, an interview I did, and also on, uh, in an Irish radio station uh, as well. There have been events all around the world. In the UK, Philosophy and Pubs has been doing Stoic Week, King's College London, Reading University. Uh, in Exeter, um, there was a talk given to some business students about how Stoic ethics could be useful in creating ethical business. Uh, Tim gave a workshop to the NHS. Um, groups met in New York, in Canada, in Ireland, and in Bangalore, in India too. And you can see the poster on the left there is the poster from Bangalore, uh, the Raga School of Music. Um, so really wonderful, it's been happening all over the world, including uh, in schools, um, so in England, we've had Wellington, Shrewsbury, Brookhouse, Sixth Form College, St. Cuthbert, James Allen's Girls' School, but also abroad in the Netherlands and in Brunei, Gerardong School. And we have a picture there of two students from Gerardong School in Brunei, and they're making reeds so that they can put them around their heads so they can be proper Stoics. Uh, and uh, we have a quote from the teacher who's been doing some amazing work uh, out in Brunei with lots of different Stoic events, Mike Hobbes. Uh, and he says, um, today was think like a stoic day at Gerardong International School, Brunei. There's a definite irony in how hard it is to remain stoic when organizing a whole school event on stoicism. <laughs> the stresses of organization were an excellent tool for testing out the ideas themselves. I'm sure we found that too, anyway. Uh, acceptance was a real challenge when a key member of the organizing committee was off sick, for example. The students took to the various stoic-themed activities around the school really well, and at the very least, they have had an experience of a very different worldview than they might normally get. A very successful day. So that's just a taster of the kind of events that have been happening around the world uh, during Stoic Week, just to give a bit of added flavor. And that's all from me. So. Thank you. Well, um, 
my area is the relationship between psychotherapy, particularly cognitive behavioural therapy and stoicism, as you've heard. And as you've perhaps seen, that's one of the areas that's caused some controversy. There's a lot of questions about the relationship between those two things. One of the things that people have asked is, you know, whether it's right to equate cognitive behavioural therapy with stoicism. And, you know, that's a straw man argument, something that I don't think anyone has ever said. What we said is that there are parallels, uh, there's some degree of overlap between the interest of CBT and the interest of stoicism, and it, it's a very fruitful area. It's useful to examine the relationship between the two things. Um, also, looking out at the audience today, I'm reminded of one of the other misconceptions that's kind of been on the internet and stuff, and that is that apparently you guys, apparently people that are into stoicism, are all men. I keep, I keep <laughs> hearing that. Um, and you're members of an elite or something like that is the other one that, that kind of comes up. But I'm glad to see that that's not true. Um, so the, the subject uh, that we're talking about, the psychotherapy stoicism thing, it's a big subject, it's a complicated subject. My book goes into it in a, a lot of detail and this afternoon I'll be able to talk about it a little bit more and I'll give you some examples because people want to be able to try out some of the exercises obviously. And you can do that when you're participating in Stoic Week, but this afternoon we're going to have a couple of workshops where we'll do guided exercises and stuff, so we'll get a chance to, to do that in a little bit more detail. So I thought I'd say a little bit about some of the key points, really, uh, from the book and from the comparison between the two things. The first one is, assuming that uh, most of, some of you may know a bit about cognitive behavioural therapy and some of you may know nothing about it at all, uh, CBT developed in the 1960s, 1970s, um, really, the earliest work on cognitive behavioural therapy was done by a guy called Albert Ellis back in the 1950s, and he developed a thing called rational therapy, uh, which subsequently became known as rational emotive behaviour therapy, or REBT. And Ellis was very heavily influenced by Stoicism. He quotes the Stoics very frequently in his writings, um, and there are many ideas and techniques in his approach to therapy that are, are very clearly influenced by Stoicism. And then also Aaron Beck, who came later, uh, the founder of Cognitive Therapy, uh, kind of inherited some of that influence via Ellis's work. And he also quotes the Stoics and was influenced by them. So Ellis and Beck, the two main founders of Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, both explicitly say that Stoicism was the main philosophical inspiration for their work. Um, and really, what does that amount to? Well, I suppose the main thing is that cognitive behavioural therapy is based on something known as the cognitive theory of emotions. And the cognitive theory of emotions says that our emotions, and therapists are particularly interested in troubling or problematic or distressing emotions, our emotions are mainly determined by our thinking, particularly our underlying beliefs. Now that's not to say that that's the only thing that determines our emotions, but simply that our beliefs or our cognitions are particularly important in determining our emotions, and that they can be changed, and that by changing our thinking, changing our beliefs, we can have a, a degree of impact on the, the emotions that we experience. And that's something that they inherit from Stoicism, that they refer to Stoicism, and, and so CBT and Stoicism share this fundamental common premise, and from that key shared premise, even if that were the only thing that they had in common, which it isn't, you know, you'd kind of expect them to draw some similar conclusions because it's such an important premise to share. They both share pre assumptions, uh, preconceptions about the, both the, about the cause of psychological disturbance that would naturally lead them to draw uh, similar conclusions about cure or about treatment. Um, in CBT, particularly in the writings of Ellis, it was very common to quote a passage from the handbook, the Stoic handbook of Epictetus. And the passage, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, says that it's not things that upset us, but our judgment about things. And that's a cliche in the CBT field. You'll see that passage quoted in most introductory textbooks in CBT. And in fact, in Ellis's approach, it was often taught to clients as part of what's known as the socialization phase at the beginning of treatment. So in order to orientate clients to therapy in order to get them to understand what their role in treatment was and the, and the basic concepts underlying the treatment, they'd be quoted that passage from Epictetus. So that's a, another important overlap. 
But again, it's not just a slogan or a maxim. That passage in itself served uh, an important psychological function. It, it was a technique. And I, I'm going to just talk a little bit about this because it's a subtle concept and a subtle technique that's particularly important to modern CBT. And it's perhaps not very well discussed in the, in the philosophical literature on stoicism. In cognitive therapy, we have this concept called cognitive distance. And basically, it's the idea that people can learn to relate to their thoughts as thoughts from a distance, rather than kind of confusing or equating their thoughts with reality. So it's the ability to see your thoughts as thoughts rather than facts. And really, uh, cognitive therapists understand that in order to dispute or to change your thoughts, it's a prerequisite that you have to be able to see them as hypotheses, as something that's up for debate, up for being questioned. Um, but recent research in psychotherapy suggests that that may even be the most important part of therapy, or one of the most important parts of therapy. The ability to gain this psych psychological distance from our thoughts and judgments seems to be tremendously therapeutic in itself, and that, that's something I'll come back to in a moment. Um, and just teaching that quotation, it's not things that upset people, but their judgment about things, that helps people to gain psychological distance. So in addition to being a slogan or a bit of theory, it also functions as a, a, a simple technique in therapy. It begins the treatment process itself. It helps people to change their perspective on their thoughts in a way that's now considered particularly important to therapy. So what other relationships are there between the two things? Well, sometimes people say, you know, are there any other overlaps? In the book that I've written, I go through them in a, a lot more detail than I can today. So I'm really going to just pick out a couple of key areas. The main verbal technique and the main visual technique used in CBT are both very similar to techniques that are found in Stoicism and, and may even be indebted to Ellis's reading of, of Stoicism. The main verbal technique that's used in CBT is called Socratic questioning, and all CBT practitioners will, will use that term to refer to it. And it basically consists in helping clients to reevaluate their own thinking, mainly in cognitive therapy by asking where's the evidence for that. So the client will typically come into therapy and say something like, you know, nobody likes me, everybody hates me, I think I'll go and eat worms or, or something. And the, uh, the therapist will say, well, where's the evidence for that? And the client will be encouraged to reevaluate their beliefs over a, a number of sessions. But therapists will, in addition to challenging the evidence uh, empirically, they'll also challenge uh, the pragmatism of certain thoughts, the consequences. So, you know, where's it getting you holding that? Uh, viewpoint on things, where's it getting you holding that attitude, um, what are the consequences of eating worms, stuff like that, helping clients to kind of weigh up the pros and cons of their thinking, and there's a bit of that in stoicism, you know, what, is, is this a healthy way of thinking? Um, but also cognitive therapists will ask clients, is that rational? Are there errors in your thinking? Um, in particular, Ellis used to ask clients, is it rational for you to treat your preferences about people liking you as if they were unconditional demands that people must like you. And Ellis was particularly interested in the negative effect of these kind of neurotic or irrational demands, which in a sense are value judgments. They're kind of rigid value judgments about what must or must not be the case in life. And that's another important area of overlap with Stoicism, and Ellis himself draws that analogy. Um, between the stoic idea that it may be counterproductive, it may be unhealthy to view external things as being intrinsically good or bad. Equally, Ellis thinks really that the core of psychological disturbance is the tendency to say that external things must or must not be the case. And uh, so these verbal techniques are very similar. And in fact, in Epictetus, he uses Socratic questioning. We, we have these transcriptions of Epictetus doing something which at times resembles a therapy workshop. You know, he's talking to visitors to his school and he's getting them to reappraise their values and their attitude towards life. In particular, there's a really good example of a visitor to his school who's disturbed by the fact that his daughter is ill and possibly dying. And he's so distressed by this that he flees her bedside. And uh, which seems like a kind of crazy counterproductive thing to do. You know, I care so much about my daughter that I can't be with her to comfort her. And Epictetus challenges us using Socratic questioning in a way that's very similar to the sort of thing that Ellis might have done. 
And in fact, Epictetus in there uses a specific strategy that's common today in cognitive therapy, which is called the double standard strategy. So he says to this guy, you know, how would you like it if you were ill and your daughter decided to run away and leave you to die on your own? You probably wouldn't like that very much. Um, so maybe you're applying a double standard. In addition to these verbal uh, strategies that they have in common, and there are many of them, but this basic idea of Socratic questioning is the, is the main area overlap. There are visual techniques that they have in common, mental imagery techniques. So there are many mental imagery techniques in CBT and many in Stoicism, and, and there are many that overlap, but probably the main one is uh, the technique that we call premeditatio malorum, or the, I call it the premeditation of adversity. And the Stoics, in particular Seneca, talk very frequently about the importance of picturing uh, future catastrophes as if they were happening now and rehearsing uh, a more philosophical way of responding to them. And they say some very interesting things about the effect of doing that and the psychological processes that are involved. Um, they say some quite sophisticated things about it, actually. Ellis's main technique in REBT, he called rational emotive imagery. And that consisted of repeatedly having the client picture aversive situations, problem situations in which they might be anxious or upset or angry as if they were happening now, rehearsing them vividly in their imagination, and then turning unhealthy, uh, neurotic, for want of a better word, responses like excessive anger into a, a rational, a healthy level of concern. And they would do that often by doing something that Ellis calls de or decatastrophizing. So starting to question whether the situation was really as bad as they were initially judging it to be, and maybe also reappraising their ability to cope with it. There are many CBT techniques that do something similar that go under different names. Um, in particular, one of the main techniques of cognitive therapy for anxiety, uh, Beck calls decatastrophizing in the image, or decatastrophizing imagery. And in that technique, the client will repeatedly and for prolonged periods, so actually maybe for like 20 or 30 minutes a day for several weeks, will visualize an anxiety-provoking scene. And they'll do that because one of the most robust findings in the entire field of research on psychotherapy is that habituation occurs through repeated prolonged exposure, which means that anxiety feelings will tend to wear off naturally if nothing prevents that from happening. And actually, you know, arguably that's not a, a cognitive process, but as it happens, it's one that the Stoics seem to refer to and seem to be aware of as well. And so Beck will say, if you visualize these things repeatedly, then your emotions will just start to settle down. You'll calm down, basically, over time. And the next step would then be to decatastrophize and ask yourself, well, so what? Is this really as bad as I initially judged it to be? It may or may not be, but often when people are upset, they catastrophize and exaggerate how bad events actually are. Um, and the next thing we'd normally do in therapy is get the client to develop a coping plan. So ask themselves, you know, what could you do to cope with this situation, even if it does happen? And then what would you do next? What would other people that you admire do to cope with a situation like this? Or what would you do to cope if you were feeling more confident? Or what would you advise someone else to do? So we'll ask perspective shifting questions to help clients develop a coping strategy. There's something very similar in Stoicism, though, because the Stoics refer very frequently to this idea repeatedly imagining scenes, but also Marcus uh, talks about saying of each individual component of a scene, you know, is this really enough to get upset about? Is it worth being distressed about this? And also, the Stoics describe using a technique that the French scholar Pierre Hadot calls physical definition, uh, which basically consists in describing a situation to yourself in very objective language, getting rid of emotive language or value judgments. And then asking yourself what virtues or what capabilities has nature given me to cope with this situation, which again is similar to what we do in therapy when we develop a coping plan. And as you're aware, perhaps, that the Stoics also advise us to contemplate the example of wise men and courageous men or virtuous people and to model or emulate their behavior, which is another obvious area of overlap between the two approaches. So main verbal technique, main imagery technique found in CBT, similar to ones found in Stoicism, and may even be kind of inherited from them via Ellis. How, how are we doing for time? I think you had your... Yeah. Time to wrap up. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, sir. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Good morning, everyone. <coughs> I'm going to talk for about 10 minutes or so about the science of Stoic Week. So if we put together ancient philosophy and modern science, what do we get? And the big question, or one of the big questions, I'll say a little about, a bit about what the other big question is later. But one of the big questions is, can Stoic practices enhance well-being? And just to preview the answer, I may surprise you a little bit by saying, the actual answer is, we don't know yet. <laughs> so, as we've talked about earlier, uh, we had a very modest ambition last year of, uh, of trying out, trying to live like a Stoic for a week. And uh, almost as an afterthought, uh, we thought, well, let's see if we can get some very crude measurements to see what effect this has on people. So what we did was uh, we invited people to uh, download a booklet and to do some exercises. Incidentally, how many people did Stoic Week last year? And I'm not expecting many people to put their hands up, but a few of you. Okay, so what you may have noticed is that we've got a little bit more sophisticated this year, although we've built on what we did last year. What we did last year was, uh, so we gave people some uh, well-being tests before they did Stoic Week, after they did Stoic Week, uh, and we also got some qualitative uh, data by uh, getting to fill in a survey say, saying how they'd found the exercises, which ones they'd done, what they'd liked about it, what they didn't like about it. We compared the scores before and after. And what did we learn? Well, it seemed that uh, comparing the scores before and after, there was about a 10% increase in well-being, which is quite impressive. Uh, and it did seem that stoicism appeared to be more effective at reducing distress than at facilitating positive emotions. So it wasn't just a case of saying what's the scores before and after. We could also say how much has, say, happiness increased, well, a bit, but how much has some negative emotions reduced? Uh, and this one was actually very consistent with, with what you'd expect from stoicism. So one of the uh, life satisfaction questions is uh, if I could live my life over, I would change almost nothing. And uh, after a week of Stoicism, people agreed with that statement by 16%, which is uh, what you'd expect, really, Stoicism uh, encouraging acceptance. Uh, in terms of reducing negative emotions, there's a question of which negative emotions does it seem to have most impact on. And uh, I was a bit surprised by this. I thought that maybe anger would be the biggest effect. So I was thinking, hmm, could we do straight workshops on anger management? Well, maybe, but actually, uh, the data that came in suggested that stoicism possibly helps more with uh, dealing with unpleasant feelings, feeling afraid, and feeling sad. Uh, now, we need to be really cautious about what this, what this shows, because uh, it wasn't a proper scientific study. We didn't have a control group. Uh, you might think choice is a good thing, but when you're doing a, a, a study, it's not. So, you know, we didn't know exactly what people were doing. We knew they were doing some of the exercises. Uh, and we didn't do a follow-up. Uh, and uh, we wrote a report on that, which if you're interested, you can still look at on the, on the website. So, but we were encouraged enough, uh, and perhaps more importantly, we got some funding to do, <laughs> to do something a, a, little bit, uh, a little bit more complete. Uh, so this year, we've had a lot more participants. Uh, and it seems that things are bigger by a factor of 10, although in today's event it's, it's actually infinity, because we didn't have this event last year. Uh, so we've got over 2,000 completed questionnaires. Uh, we've got a suggested timetable of exercises. So rather it was just, here are some exercises, do them as you feel like it. We've got, it's Monday, do this, it's Tuesday, do such and such. Uh, and uh, we've also piloting something called the Stoic Attitudes and Behaviours Scale, how many of you have done that? How many of you have filled that in? Uh, quite, quite a few. Uh, and when I did my workshop in the NHS this week, uh, everyone was very keen on finding out how, how stoic they were. So what this allows you to do is to see whether you have stoic attitudes and whether you have stoic behaviours. And what it allows us to do is to see whether these stoic attitudes and behaviour are associated with well-being. And uh, I haven't analysed the data fully, but I had a quick peek at it, and uh, the results looked quite interesting. But watch this space to find out more details about, about that. Uh, and then we plan to do a three-month follow-up. Uh, 
But there are still limitations. We haven't got a control group, for instance. And the, the stoic attitudes and behavior scale, it's just a pilot scale. It hasn't been validated yet. Uh, so what can we conclude so far? Well, we know there's a lot of interest in stoicism and applying stoic ideas. Uh, we know that quite a lot of people appear to be benefiting. But to be honest, it's too early to know whether stoicism is uniquely <laughs> beneficial. And I might get lynched for saying this, but I'll risk it uh, anyway. You know, it could be that there could be a, a week of living like an Epicurean or an existentialist, <laughs> and it might be, it might be beneficial too. We don't, we don't know. Obviously, we, we in this panel think that stoicism has got some unique benefits, but we can't really prove that yet. We don't know whether the results are lasting. For instance, it might be that people just got a kind of feeling good just by being part of Stoic Week. Uh, so we don't know whether that lasts yet. And also, we don't know whether Stoicism is particularly useful for particular conditions. And in the working in the NHS, this is something we're particularly interested in. Is it, for instance, good at people uh, with long-term conditions, such as diabetes? Is it good at anger man management? We'd expect it to be particularly helpful for building up resilience in people, the ability to deal with adversity. Uh, so what are our Stoic hopes? Well, we hope to be able to say much more after analysing the results of Stoic Week 2013. Watch this space, watch the website, uh, and indeed you can be part of that by filling in your questionnaires. Uh, and we hope that uh, this Stoic Week will provide the momentum for further research. So, uh, and to, just to say this afternoon, I'm, I'm going to be talking about uh, another big question, which is not only can Stoicism enhance well-being, but can it actually enhance wisdom, because that's something that we might think science might lack. So, uh, and that's something which I think we're only starting to grapple with. Uh, so thank you very much.